you are looking at international RF protection guidelines for general population exposure. And you will notice that the US and Canadian guideline is at least 100 times higher than what you get from countries like Russia, China, Poland, Italy, Switzerland, and 10,000 times higher than guidelines you get in Austria, and up to 3.5 million times higher than what independent scientists recommend. So the question is this, why are other countries adopting stronger guidelines? And why do the US and Canada have the weakest RF exposure standards in the whole world? Have Americans and Canadians developed some kind of superhuman power that makes us immune to higher levels of radiation when compared to other people? I don't think so. So the next few minutes I will cover why these standards are so different worldwide, and more importantly, I will show you easy and convenient ways that you can protect yourself and your family against dangerous levels of radiation. But first to begin, let's get some basic background understanding of what we're talking about. And I'll do this by asking you a question. What do radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet light, x-rays, and gamma rays all have in common? And the answer is that they are all part of what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. And so the next question is, what makes them so different from each other? For example, What's the difference between the radiation from radio waves, which of course allow you to listen to your favorite music station, and the radiation from microwaves? And the simple answer is wavelength and frequency. Radio waves are long waves that have a low frequency. Microwaves are shorter waves with a higher frequency than radio waves. And as we keep moving up the electromagnetic spectrum, the waves keep getting shorter and the frequencies higher. The spectrum I'll be discussing in this lecture are man-made microwaves. And that's the range of frequencies that cell phones, Wi-Fi, and smart meters emit, along of course with your microwave ovens. In fact, microwave ovens and most cordless phones operate in the 2.4 GHz spectrum, which is the same as that used by your Wi-Fi wireless network. And that's why a microwave oven can cause interference with your network, even slowing down your connection. In a regular household, there's just so much congestion at 2.4 GHz that neural Wi-Fi is operating at 5 GHz just to avoid traffic and interference from the other waves in your home. And the scary thing is that people don't see, and most people don't feel, all of this radiation that is surrounding and penetrating them 24-7. In fact, only a small part of the electromagnetic spectrum can be seen by the naked eye, and that's visible light. And the rest? We don't see it. And there lies a the challenge. We love the convenience of all of our appliances. We keep them on all the time. We're getting zapped to the point that there's congestion in our home. Yet we don't see any of the dangers. Meanwhile, it is well understood that we absorb all waves of the electromagnetic spectrum. Some more so than others. But it's not all bad. Quite the contrary. Some wavelengths are actually therapeutic. For example, far-infrared saunas are one of the greatest tools for detoxification used internationally by some of the top health institutes. That's because infrared is good. It's compatible with the human body. And we all understand the benefits of getting enough natural light, including UVB light that we absorb, allowing our body to produce vitamin D, which in turn helps to properly regulate our genes. We cannot see infrared or UVB radiation with our eyes, Yet our body absorbs all of these waves in a very natural way. And this can be healthy and therapeutic. But on the other hand, exposure to man-made microwaves are not compatible with our biology. And they are damaging to the human body. But before we dive into the science that has led countries around the world to adopt very strict regulations, I want to make sure that you understand once and for all that exposure to all radiation affects us, for better or worse. And that's because, fundamentally, we are first and foremost electrical beings ourselves. And that's right, and it's something that most people don't think about or forget very often, but it's a simple foundation of all life on Earth. We are electrical beings. After all, think about this, we get diagnosed electrically all the time. We have electrocardiograms, to measure the activity of our heart, we test the electric activity of our brains. If we run a marathon or suffer from food poisoning, we are quickly told to consume what? 
electrolytes, otherwise we could die. And all of the cells that make up our body rely on their own little frequencies to keep us alive. Now hold on to your seat because I'm about to tell you that you even emit radiation from your body. That's right, humans emit electromagnetic waves in the infrared wave band. And of course, even the Earth has its natural magnetic field that is compatible with the human body. So yes, not only are we surrounded by, but we are also made up of natural electric frequencies. And any disruption to our cells' natural frequencies, such as that caused from what is now being called electropollution, is cause for major concern. So now is a great time to begin explaining why governments around the world have taken a strong precautionary approach to protect their citizens, recognizing the dangers of electropollution and setting radiation exposure limits that are a hundred to thousands of times lower than Canadian and US guidelines. And why they've done this is very simple. It's a one word answer. Science. That's right. They use science to make decisions. Now let's take a look at charts that summarize some of these findings. And here we are specifically looking at the biological effects of low intensity radio frequency radiation exposure, such as that emitted from smart meters and Wi-Fi. Now I'm not going to show you all the charts and go through all the findings, but I'll just highlight a few of these for you. Here you see that chronic exposure to a power density of 0.00034 microwatts per centimeter squared resulted in significantly reduced sperm count. To put things into context, 0.00034 microwatts per centimeter squared is almost 3 million times lower than the US and Canadian guideline, which is 1000 microwatts per centimeter squared. And here we have that exposure to 0.006 to 0.01 microwatts per centimeter squared resulted in an increase in stress hormones while dopamine levels decreased. Here, exposure at 8.75 microwatts per centimeter squared for 2 to 12 hours caused DNA breaks in leukemia cells. At 50 microwatts, we see a decrease in REM sleep. At 60 microwatts, we see that pulsed radiofrequency radiation affects immune function in white blood cells. At 92.5, we see genetic changes in human white blood cells. And for all of you men and women out there who are concerned about your testosterone levels, after just 6 hours of exposure of 100 microwatts, we see a 24.3% drop in testosterone. Another study here shows us that at 500 microwatts per centimeter squared, which is very high but still only 50% of the US and Canadian guideline, we see again a 24.6% drop in testosterone and a 23.2% drop in insulin after just 12 hours of pulsed radiofrequency radiation exposure. And the studies go on to show brain and neurological disorders, infertility, DNA damage, cardiovascular effects, decreased immune function, and cancer. You can find all of these charts along with a 1,800 page report prepared by scientists, doctors, and other experts at bioinitiative.org. And particularly at risk are, of course, our children. Our children are the first generation ever to be exposed to high levels of microwave radiation 24-7. They are guinea pigs. After all, they are being exposed to more radiation than has ever been researched. And this is why in 2013, the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the AAP, wrote a letter to the FCC urging the FCC to change its radiofrequency radiation standards to reflect the current scientific evidence on the dangers of wireless technology. The American Association of Pediatrics is a non-profit professional organization that consists of 60,000 primary care pediatricians, pediatric medical subspecialists, and pediatric surgical specialists dedicated to the health, safety, and well-being of infants, children, adolescents, and young adults. And so the president of this organization wrote to the FCC, and I'll quote from the letter. He said, Children are not little adults and are disproportionately impacted by all environmental exposures, including cell phone radiation. Current FCC standards do not account for the unique vulnerability and use patterns specific to pregnant women and children. 
it is essential that any new standard for cell phones or other wireless devices be based on protecting the youngest and most vulnerable populations to ensure they are safeguarded throughout their lifetimes. End of quote. Now let me tell you about the FCC. FCC stands for the Federal Communications Commission. And in 1996, the Telecommunications Act gave the FCC total power over the issue of environmental health and radiofrequency radiation exposure. So to this day, the FCC holds the responsibility for setting the RF radiation guidelines in the USA. The FCC's current RF radiation exposure guidelines are 3.5 million times higher than recommendations by independent researchers. And that's to be expected for several reasons. And the first reason is that the FCC bases its standards on 1996 information, most of which was derived from short-term studies conducted in the early 80s. That's right, the 80s, when Michael J. Fox had his Teen Wolf movies coming out. <laughs> in his letter to the FCC, the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics reminds us that, and I'll quote again, the FCC has not assessed the standard for cell phone radiation since 1996. Approximately 44 million people had mobile phones when the standard was set. Today, there are more than 300 million mobile phones in use in the United States. End of quote. And it gets worse. The US government has not conducted a single study on the biological effect of wireless technology since the 1990s. There is no safety testing before digital devices and electronics hit the market. This includes all your kids' games. And remember that the newer technologies that we are using today, such as iPads, iPhones, or 4G networks, well, they've only been around for five years. Let me put it this way. Let's think of an imaginary child, let's say a little eight-year-old boy, and let's call him Tommy. Let me give you a day in Tommy's life. Tommy goes to sleep and wakes up in a home where he is exposed to microwaves from Wi-Fi, from cordless phones that pulse all day even when not in use, from smart meters that also pulse all day long, and then Tommy is driven to school in a car that features Bluetooth technology. And then Tommy spends his day in a school that is currently debating whether or not to install a Wi-Fi network. At lunchtime, Tommy realizes, oh shoot, he forgot to grab his lunchbox from the kitchen counter. So he calls his mom or his dad, on his cell phone of course, to let one of them know that they should probably bring him his lunch. Then Tommy comes home has dinner, and after dinner, guess what he's doing? He's playing on a wireless Nintendo or Xbox video game. This child is exposed to microwaves, over microwaves, over microwaves, all day long, either directly or indirectly from his environment. And, as the president of the American Academy of Pediatrics wrote, a child is not just a small-sized adult. A child is still developing, and a lot more vulnerable to the biological effects of electrical magnetic fields. And here is a simple illustration of this fact. Remember how I explained that we absorb all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum? Here you can see how children absorb microwaves through their entire brain. And again, these are microwaves, same as what they are exposed to with electronic games they play, Wi-Fi and smart meters they are exposed to, 4G networks and so forth, all of which we never tested. We have science to indicate we should take a precautionary approach, especially for our children. And that doesn't mean we should stop advancements of technology. Far from it. We just want to learn more and improve technology to better serve us as opposed to causing harm. So in short, the first reason that the FCC guidelines are 3.5 million times higher than recommendations by independent scientists is that it's chosen to turn a blind eye to any scientific data since the 90s. And this has appalled many scientists, including some scientists at the Karolinska Institute in Sweden, where they award a Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. And there is a press release from the Karolinska Institute's Department of Neuroscience that is worth reading and I'll go through parts of it with you. So, they recommend that lower limits be established for electromagnetic fields and wireless exposures based on scientific studies reporting health impacts at much lower exposure levels. 
Many researchers now believe the existing safety limits are inadequate to protect public health because they do not consider prolonged exposure to lower emission levels that are now widespread. End of quote. And so this press release goes on to say that the current US and ICN IRP standards for radio frequency and microwave radiation from wireless technologies are, and I'll quote again, entirely inadequate, and that billions of people around the world are at risk for cancer, neurological disease, and reproductive and developmental impairments. And the press release continues to warn us that the smart grid concept could require every home to have a wireless electric and gas meter in place of their existing meters. If implemented, it will greatly increase the intensity of new wireless emissions in homes, schools, and every other building that uses electricity and gas." End of quote. And this means that they are obviously against smart meters, stating that the speed of the rollouts of these wireless technologies has outpaced both health studies and calls for more restrictive public safety limits. And that again was the press release written from the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm and written by scientists who actually study radio frequency radiation from wireless technologies. Now let's get back to talking about the FCC and why they haven't informed and educated the public or changed their guidelines to a safer level. First, you have to understand that the FCC is not a safety or health agency. Far from it. The FCC is actually a licensing and engineering group. They are a bunch of engineers that don't really care about biological effects. So what do they care about? Well, the FCC's official mission statement is to make available, as far as possible, wire and radio communication services at reasonable charges. And under its first goal, the FCC writes that Regulatory policies must promote technological neutrality, competition, investment, and innovation to ensure that broadband service providers have sufficient incentives to develop and offer such products and services. In other words, the FCC's number one goal is to improve profits for broadband service providers. And the FCC has six official goals, none of which have to do with your health. And these people that are constantly working for the telecommunications industry are supposed to police themselves. That's like the oil companies being in charge of setting environmental policies. This is what we call conflicts of interest. And here is another example. The Canadian Medical Association Journal reported conflicts of interest within the panel in charge of recommending radio frequency exposure limits. The Royal Society of Canada was in charge of electing this panel and to defend itself claim that it is difficult to identify researchers without industry ties. So if you do not understand that in North America corporations have the power to do as they please, and there is a long history of this, then you need to get your head out from under the sand because by now you should have a clear understanding as to why the US and Canadian RF exposure guidelines are so much higher than they should be, especially if we were to base ourselves on scientific evidence and look towards the good of humanity instead of profits.